season and uh, it's my great honor to invite Dr. Shashinda Sundaram from Apollo Hospital, Muscat, Oman. So he's going to talk about shoulder instability and the treatment options. Okay, over to you, Shashinder. Okay, fine. Afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet of you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hitesh and Babit for uh, making this happen. So um, I have been given a topic of shoulder instability. I have made it a little bit of uh, simple for a for graduation audience because uh, shoulder instability is a very complex topic. So um, we'll take it simple the way you need it for your postgraduate examination. Okay, so. Okay, I think uh, you can see my slides, right? Fine, let's go. Okay, so I will cover the topics in the following way. First, we'll talk about the concept of the stability in the shoulder joint. Then uh, what is instability? What are the um, um, concepts that you need to understand in respect to instability? The directions of instability? and talk about uh, the tubs and ambry concepts, the recurrent instability, and the treatment of all this. Okay. So first of all, you all know that the shoulder is the most unstable joint that comes at the expense um, because it has high mobility and that comes at the expense of instability. So what are the what are the factors that lead to the stability of the shoulder joint? We have static, static factors and we have dynamic factors. All those factors that don't like sort of move or contract, they can be categorized as the static factors. Those factors that are dynamic or contract can be classified on, under the dynamic factors. So under the static factors, you have the bony component, the ligaments, the fibrocartilaginous structure, that are also ligaments and the uh, actual ligaments. And in the dynamic factors, you have the muscular structure that are the most importantly the rotator cuff and all the extra articular ligaments. In addition, you also have the negative pressure concept in the shoulder joint that also contributes to the dynamic stability of the shoulder joint. So what are the, what are the things you need to know in osteology or the bone component of static shoulder stability. You need to understand that the scapular blade is not parallel to the coronal plane. It's at 30 degrees to the coronal plane. So a lot of things change in relation to this. The glenoid has a, a retroversion of seven degrees and uh, the humeral head has a corresponding retroversion or intorsion of 30 degrees. So all these lead to a better stability um, there is more preference as far as the factors that lead to stability are concerned. Um, the factors have tried to prevent more and more of anterior to shoulder instability because that is that is the most common instability. Then you have the glenoid labrum. The glenoid labrum is a fibrocartilaginous structure that lines the uh, anterior and posterior glenoid rim and the inferior glenoid rim. If you see the bony structure of the glenoid and the humeral head, you have a large ball on a small cup. Okay. Only one third of the humeral head is covered by the glenoid articular surface, the bony component of the glenoid. Okay, that's why you have the glenoid labrum on the front and the back and the inferior aspect. It increases the articular surface, the functional articular surface of the glenoid, thereby giving more stability. It acts sort of like a compound wall to prevent the ball from slipping forward or backward. Then you have the capsular structures around the shoulder jam. Again, it is a static structure. Okay, the capsule is the uh, fibrocartilage, the fibrous tissue that is uh, surrounding the joint. 
um, it's more lax on the inferior aspect, which is what allows the humeral head to abduct over. If the capsule is not lax inferiorly, you cannot abduct this joint above. Okay, but there is a negative side to it. That is the increased incidence of anterior shoulder instability because of the lax inferior capsule. Okay, you also have numerous ligaments. The most important are the glenohumeral ligaments. You have the superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral ligament. Of these three, the inferior glenohumeral ligament is the most important and the largest structure. In addition, you also have ligaments starting from the coracoid to the humerus, called the coracohumeral ligament. It partially contributes to the glenohumeral instability. It also is very important for the stability of the biceps tendon. In other words, it prevents instability of the biceps tendon from the bicipital groove. Okay, so the too many structures around the shoulder joint that uh, contribute to the stability. We are not going into the detailed anatomy of the glenohumeral ligaments that itself should be a separate uh, class. We have gone to the functional components. And with respect to the dynamic factors, you have the rotator cuff. Why is it called rotator cuff? Because all the muscles that contribute to this system, that is the subscapularis, supraspinatus, intraspinatus, teres minor, they all form a cuff of tissue around the shoulder joint. That's why it's called rotator cuff. And they rotate the shoulder, so it's called rotator. Okay, so how does it contribute to the stability of the shoulder joint. If you see this image here, the subscapularis which is in front and supraspinatus is there on the top, you are not able to see the intraspinatus and teres minor, but if you see all of them, they all contract towards the body's midline. So all of them sort of create a compressive force of the ball over the cuff. Okay, that's how the radial cuff works. It causes compression of the head over the cuff and stabilizes the head. There are also other structure, the long head of biceps, it forms a sling on the fringe, stabilizing the humeral head. The contribution is not as important, but it still does. The deltoid, in addition to its function of abducting the arm, it also contributes to the uh, stability by creating a vector medially, just like the rotator. And you also have the scapulothoracic muscles, latissimus dorsi, teres major, and all that. Okay. I was talking earlier, all joints have a negative intraarticular pressure system. Okay. Similarly, the shoulder joint has a minus 42 centimeter water uh, negative pressure system. Um, which is which happened because it is not connected to the air, but suppose you are doing an arthroscopic procedure, or you put a needle into the joint, or you put an arthroscope into the joint, the negative pressure system is uh, released. Okay, but when there is no uh, uh, what do you say uh, um, uh, interruption in the connective tissues, there is a negative pressure system that is working, which also contributes a lot to the stability of. The so finally, to, to summarize, you have the static structures and the dynamic structures. In the static structures, you have the bony component and the soft tissue component. In the bony component, you have the shape of the bones, that is the green and articular surface. Then you have the head, that is the ball. Then you also have the other bony uh, parameters like the versions, that is the retroversion of the glenoid, the retroversion of the humeral head, the scapular uh, plane, that is 30 degree in front, and the corresponding uh, retroversion of the humeral head of 30 degrees, all these contribute to the static stability. And in the dynamic stability, you have the rotator cuff and the other muscles, and also the negative pressure system inside the shoulder. Okay, fine. Now we go on to the actual talk on instability. So what is instability? The inability of, the, of a joint to maintain in position. Or in other words, uh, inability of the glenohumeral joint to maintain its in situ position. 
So why does it happen? Because the shoulder is a very mobile joint, so mobility always comes at the expense of stability. And um, and there is a small cup and a big ball, so obviously uh, the instability risk is high, even though there are parameters which try to reduce the risk of instability. Sorry. Okay, fine. So there's a concept called Tubbs and Ambry, which you would have uh, heard or read already. So what is Tubbs? Trauma, unidirectional, bank card surgery. Ambry is atraumatic, multidirectional, bilateral, rehabilitation, inferior. So let me explain to you. So there are two uh, broad concepts of shoulder instability. So one is the one that results from trauma. The other is one that does not necessarily need trauma. Okay, So when there is a trauma, whether it's uh, towards anterior or posterior, superior or inferior, there is some sort of injury. So even a normal tissue previously could get injured and lead to uh, instability. That is the concept of tubs. When Even in the absence of trauma, the structures congenitally or uh, habitually have become in such a way that they do not maintain the stability. So there is a laxity that leads to increased risk of instability. In the traumatic type, it's almost always unidirectional because there is a vector that is uh, pushing the joint in one particular direction. Just so it's almost always unidirectional. It does not always require surgery, but if it requires, it does well after surgery. For example, after a first episode of dislocation, you don't need to do a surgery, but then there is recurrent, then there are recurrent dislocations after a history of trauma, then they do very well with surgery. In the atraumatic multidirectional group, they are mostly, in the atraumatic group, they are mostly multidirectional because the capsule is stretched. In the catalyst stretch, it is unlikely that it can get stretched only in one location, that is anterior or posterior. So it usually stretches globally. So there is multidirectional instability, both anterior and posterior. Whether in history or in examination, you will be able to identify multidirectional instability. So this multidirectional instability, again, is more likely to be bilateral because it's something that is congenital because of generalized ligament laxity or uh, mild syndromic associations and all that. Okay, so this group does not do very well with surgery because uh, if a patient has uh, the concept of, my, uh, what do you say, ligament, uh, generalized ligament laxity, even when you do surgery, even after that, the ligaments can get stretched or become lax. So it's still possible that they can get instability after that. And there is another concept, another uh, group that is the habitual, uh, possibly with uh, some sort of a psychiatric association. They have a tendency to try and dislocate the shoulder repeatedly. These are the people, they don't respond very well to the regular surgical procedures. They tend to dislocate it again and again. So what do you do? You, you do something called, I mean, in addition to the rehabilitation protocol, you can, if you need surgery, you can do something called inferior shift. That is the stretched capsule that is getting tightened over there. But a lot of times what happens is you have an overlap of these, these um, concepts and uh, you have to take a call regarding what is best for the patient. Okay, so we will go on to the traumatic types. In the traumatic, you can classify based on the direction of instability. It can be anterior, it can be posterior, it can be inferior, or it can even be superior. Okay, anterior shoulder instability is the most common one. 97% of dislocations are anterior. And again, anterior can be categorized as subcoracoid, subglenoid, subclavicular, and other um, I am supposed to have an image here. It's missing. Okay, so, so the anterior dislocation can be, the ball or the head can be just below the, below the coracoid, so it's called subcoracoid. 
that just in front of the glenoid and inferiorly, this antero inferior dislocation is called subglenoid. The head can dislocate more medially, that is subclavicula, or there can be a major trauma, the head can lie into, inside the thoracic cage, it's called intrathoracic. The mechanism is mostly a fall on outstretched hand, especially in abduction and external rotation. Sometimes there is a direct blow on the arm in the direction of anterior dislocation that causes the dislocation. What happens is either there can be a rupture of the capsule, the glenoid labrum can get torn, or there can be a fracture in the antero inferior rim of glenoid leading to dislocation anteriorly. The clinical picture is a pain in the shoulder, severe pain in the shoulder. They are not able to abduct or use the arm. And when you examine, you will be able to see a loss of contour of the deltoid because uh, the contour is provided by the presence of the bulky humeral head on the glenoid. On top of it, the deltoid creates the contour. But when the glenoid is or the humeral head is not in the glenoid anymore and it's dislocated medially, there's nothing that is projecting out, so the contour is gone. Okay. Uh, in an acute dislocation, you may not be able to ask the patient to do a the gas test and all that, but uh, you can try if it is like a recurrent instability, you can try and uh, the Hamilton ruler test where you place a scale on the lateral aspect uh, from the acromion until the lateral epicondyle. If it is touching all over the lateral aspect, then the Hamilton ruler test is positive. That is suggestive of an anterior dislocation of the shoulder. So here is a picture which shows the loss of the lateral contour of the deltoid. That is because the humeral head is dislocated anteriorly. Uh, as a comparison between the left and the right, the right side there is a flattening of the deltoid contour, so it's suggestive of a dislocation. Uh, a beautiful thing is when you try to examine gently in this area, that is the anterior aspect, just in front of the glenoid and inferiorly, you will be able to feel the ball of the humerus, that is the head of the humerus. That is again clinically uh, confirmation of your anterior dislocation of the shoulder. Okay, and anterior dislocation, as I told you, is almost always inferior, and pro is per and pro inferior dislocation. What do you do? You have to take X-rays. You have to take at least two X-rays because uh, um, uh, you want to see in uh, both both the planes. And uh, the, the equivalent of lateral x-ray for the shoulder is the scapula Y view or the axillary view. Scapula Y view is a better x-ray for uh, humeral head dislocation. Okay, so and uh, in the AP view, you have to take a shoulder AP view, not a chest AP view. So you have to prime your radio, radio, radiology technician to take a shoulder AP view that is uh, around 30 degree tilted towards the shoulder because the scapular plane is at 30 degree in relation to the coronal plane of the body. So what you see in the scapular Y view, this, this is the chest wall. So this has to be anterior and this has to be posterior. This is the on the, on the front of the, hum, of the scapula, of the body of scapula is the coracoid. So this is the coracoid process, and this is the spinal scapula and the acromion coming over here. So the coracoid and the spinal scapula together form a Y along with the body of the scapula, okay? And this region, that is the junction of the three, uh, uh, the center of the Y, that is the glenoid, or the glenoid articular surface. The head, the humeral head should be lying on top of the glenoid. So this is a normal shoulder. So this is a scapular Y view, and that is how you have to read. This is the anteroposterior X-ray of uh, again. It looks more like a chest X-ray. Uh, it shows a humeral head that is dislocated anteriorly. 
uh, again, this uh, anterior AP chest, AP shoulder x ray is showed the humeral head that is uh, dislocated anteriorly, and this uh, scapula Y view. Okay, so the chest wall is on the frame, so this, uh, this is the anterior, so this is the coracoid. On, on the back, you have the spinal scapula and the chromium. Here you see the beautiful glenoid. In the previous x ray, you were not able to see the glenoid clearly because the head is opposed over the glenoid, so it's sort of difficult over there. But here the head is snowed anteriorly and the glenoid is here. You are able to see the glenoid better here, so this is an anterior shoulder dislocation. Okay. Um, this scapula Y view is specifically more important for a suspected posterior shoulder dislocation because the AP view almost always looks normal in a posterior dislocation. So in the Y view in a posterior dislocation, the head is expected to see seen on the posterior aspect instead of the anterior aspect. So what do you do? You make sure the pain, a patient is not in too much of pain, reduce the pain, then uh, make the diagnosis with x-rays, and then you proceed on with some sort of a reduction procedure. It can be done either in the emergency department or in the operation room. Just make sure the patient is comfortable. If needed, take the help of the anesthetist. There are a lot of ways in which uh, you can achieve analgesia, either sedation or uh, uh, or uh, general anesthesia by by mask. Some people even do intra-articular uh, lignocaine or uh, chirocaine or bupivacaine injection. Um, I don't do it regularly, but uh, it has to be it has to has been shown to be very useful. Just make sure you dilute the uh, lignocaine or uh, bupivacaine a lot and make sure you have backup in case there are signs of uh, uh, risk of chondrogenic toxicity because of lignocaine. So if possible, try to avoid it. If you have the facility, try to avoid it. We'll continue with the management. Um, so you go on with the initial management, you make sure the patient does not have too much of pain, make sure the patient is comfortable, and the means in which you can achieve anesthesia, either you do uh, uh, some sort of a local anesthesia in terms of intraarticular injection of lignocaine or mucocaine or chiracaine, or uh, you can use sedation, or if uh, all these are not uh, I mean, helpful or you're not uh, comfortable with the analgesia or the patient is too apprehensive, then you can go ahead with the general anesthesia, okay? So uh, there are certain issues that you need to be concerned about uh, intra-articular lignocaine or uh, bupivacaine or chiracaine anesthesia or analgesia. It can be chondrotoxic. So make sure you have diluted it well and if possible, try to avoid it. And there is also a risk of systemic uh, cardiotoxicity. So make sure you have some backup before you proceed on with this type of analgesia. Okay, then you go on to uh, the actual treatment procedure that is either closed reduction or open reduction. 99% of the cases, you will be able to treat the anterior dislocation in a closed method. The most commonly used method is the traction contraction method. The less commonly used are Hippocrates and Stinson methods. The Cocker technique was uh, in, in various uh, modifications, it is being uh, used more and more nowadays. So in the traction contraction method, you have your assistant giving traction from the chest wall and the actual surgeon or the physician gives traction on the arm. Make sure the analgesia is good. Make sure the patient relaxes. Otherwise, you are going to keep on struggling. It's not going to happen. Reduction is not going to happen. So patient relaxation is very important. And so analgesia is very important. Sedation helps a lot to reduce the anxiety of the patient. So basically, make sure the traction and contraction are in the same line. Then you have the Hippocrates method. You put the foot, the the consultant or the physician puts the foot on the chest wall that sort of gives the contraction and you give traction on the arm but uh, it looks sort of cumbersome the patient can get uh, more anxious so uh, and this is one of the methods that can be slightly more traumatic so you can try to avoid 
especially if there can be too much of pressure on the axilla, so there can be pressure on the axillary structures. So we don't want to land up in palsy. So that's something you can try to avoid. Okay, then you have the Stimson method. You have Stimson method in almost all the joints, including the hip joint. The regular concept is it works by gravity. You ask the patient to lie prone, rest, um, hang the arm with or without a weight, preferably with a weight. Over time, the patient uh, loses the pain, so he relaxes and the muscles get relaxed and the head reduces. Okay. And this is the cocker technique. There are multiple uh, mnemonics in which uh, this is being used. One of them is TEAM, T E A M, traction, external rotation, adduction, medial rotation. Okay, so uh, I have I have done this. See, a lot of people, a uh, lot of people don't advise the cocker technique, but there are a lot of other modifications of cocker technique that are being proposed which have been there for hundreds of years. Uh, the traction is not actually very important. It's not necessary that uh, a lot of traction is needed. You can just give a mild traction or you can even forget about the traction. Just make sure you have external rotate the arm and then adduct the arm over the chest wall and then medial rotate. Most of the cases it reduces. If it's not happening, I mean, uh, after you have tried for two times, don't keep repeating, either go under general anesthesia or you can try under traction counter traction. Just make sure you don't manipulate too much. You don't want to score the cartilage or damage the cartilage and iatrogenically create uh, arthritis for the patient in the future. Okay, so you have, it can have a lot of complications. Complication either because of the actual injury, that is the dislocation, or iatrogenically because of um, your procedure. So you can have a nerve injury, most commonly it is axillary nerve injury, or axillary arterial injury. There can be ligament tears. Almost always it happens with the ligament tear, except when it is on the AMRI side or uh, except when the capsule is already latched. Most of the time there is a ligament tear, most of the time it is the anterior glenoid labrum that is torn along with the middle or inferior glenohumeral ligament. Sometimes there can also be fracture of the inferior glenoid. And uh, especially when the dislocation has happened for a couple of times, there is something called the hill sac lesion. So this is an example of the uh, anteroinferior glenoid fracture. And this is an example of the hill sac lesion. When, what happens is the humeral head is a cancellous bone. It's a spongy bone. So when it dislocates anteriorly, there's a lot of uh, point pressure on the posterolateral aspect of the humeral head. There is impression fracture of the anterior glenoid rim over the humeral head. And that is called the hill sac lesion. Okay. So his saclation is the uh, impression fracture of the posterolateral lateral aspect of the humeral head because of anterior dislocation. And in uh, actually in neuropathy, you can have the human touch uh, sign. Okay, again, this is an illustration of the his saclation, the humeral head dislocates anteriorly, the capsule is torn here, the labrum which stays here, that is also torn and it moves medially here. The humeral head is coming and docking over the anterior inferior glenoid rim, and there is an impression fracture over there. After you reduce, what happens is you have a torn capsule and a torn anterior glenoid labrum, and on the posterior aspect, you have a large hill sac lesion. So this is called a bipolar lesion. That means you have a lesion on the anterior aspect and you have a lesion on the Posterior aspect. These are the lesions that uh, can lead to recurrent shoulder instability. If the patient is coming again with recurrence of uh, instability and the age of the patient is less, that means he is likely to have more and more dislocations on, in the future. You have to intervene and do some sort of a procedure in order to increase the stability of this structure. Okay, we will talk about it. Okay. 
So you can also have a smaller risk of avascular necrosis or heterotopic calcification, especially in the presence of a head injury. And the most common complication is the recurrent shoulder dislocation. Then you have that posterior dislocation. It constitutes only 5 to 10% of the dislocation. It happens when the arm is adducted and flexed and internally rotated. Again, it can be either by an indirect force or a direct force. Indirect is uh, especially uh, after an electric shock or a seizure episode, the posterior muscles are more strong. So when they contract, they pull the head on the back. Or uh, that can be a direct force on the front of the shoulder, pushing the ball backwards. Okay, so this uh, illustration of a posterior dislocation with the glenoid, with the glenoid and the humeral head is on the back. This is the correct height, so this should be anterior. This is the spinal scapula, this posterior. Okay, now this is what I was talking about. This is the AP X-ray of the left shoulder. The humeral head almost looks like it is in the shoulder joint. Okay, this is how uh, posterior dislocation will look, and that is also the reason why posterior dislocations are most commonly missed. Okay, but you have to look at something called the light bulb appearance. That means the humeral head is looking more symmetrical both medially and laterally. That is because the humeral head is internally rotated because of the dislocation. And this is the scapula Y view. As we discussed earlier, this is the friend, this is the back, this is the coracoid, this is the spinal scapula, and this is the body of the scapula. And the humeral head is lying on the posterior aspect. So this is a posterior dislocation. If you are seeing this X-ray and uh, you have a doubt, you have, I mean, you have to take a Y view, but uh, for uh, theory purposes, if you are seeing this X-ray and you have a doubt, look at the Y view and see whether the head is lying posteriorly. Now, after reduction, the head is lying on the glenoid, so it's a reduced shoulder dislocation. Again, the methods are uh, similar. It's uh, uh, mostly a close reduction can work, but a posterior dislocation can lead higher uh, chance. There are higher chances that it can need a open reduction in comparison to an anterior dislocation, especially because the posterior dislocation is something that is commonly missed, and most of the time the patient comes like one month or two months down the line with a persistent shoulder dislocation. And that's when the capsule, the muscles have all contracted already. So you won't be able to do a close reduction. That is when a open reduction may be needed. Okay. Uh, operative treatment. Operative treatment is needed either when the closed method has failed or when there is a recurrent shoulder dislocation or when there is a large bony fragment that has fractured even in a primary shoulder dislocation. That is the first time dislocator. For example, there is a large anteroinferior glenoid labrum fracture. You know for sure that it's going to dislocate subsequently. There is no point in waiting for a recurrence of the dislocation. You can go ahead with the uh, fixation procedure for the bony uh, fracture. Okay. In a posterior uh, dislocation, uh, you talk about a reverse hill circulation, just like we had a, a hill circulation in a dislocation. You talk about posterior, uh, reverse hill circulation in a posterior dislocation because the head comes behind. This is the crocoid, okay? The crocoid is the posterior aspect, this is the anterior aspect because the head comes behind. There is an impression fracture on the anteromedial aspect of the humeral head. Again, the complications are similar. Then we have the inferior dislocation. It's otherwise called luxatio recta. Luxatio means luxation. Luxation is dislocation. Erecta is erect or straight or vertical. Okay, so why is it called so? Because after an inferior dislocation, the head is locked under the glenoid, the patient won't be able to uh, adduct the arm again. So the patient comes to you with uh, like this, with the arm elevated and the forearm resting on the head because they can't adduct the arm again. Okay, how does it happen? Most of the times it's an indirect injury because of an hyper abduction mechanism. What happens is this, the acromion on top that impinges on the neck region of the humerus and uh, the head is levered out into the inferior aspect of the humerus. 
Fine. This is how the patient comes to you. The head is lying inferior to the glenoid seat. This is the inferior margin of the glenoid. This is the glenoid articular surface. The head is beneath the glenoid. The arm is abducted. You do traction, contraction, and you reduce it. Most of the time, it's successful. Okay. There are some situations when there is button holing of the humeral head. That means there is a tear in the capsule. The, the capsule doesn't get stretched, but there is a tear in the capsule. The humeral head dislocates through the capsule, and it is not possible to reduce the shoulder joint anymore. So this is called button holing. It can need an open procedure in order to reduce it. Okay, the complications are similar. The complications of vascular injury and neurological injury are higher in an inferior shoulder dislocation. You also have a type called the superior shoulder dislocation. It's very rare, so you need not worry about it. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so evaluation we have um, uh, with respect to a traumatic dislocation, we have seen it already. You have a painful shoulder that is dislocated, you're not able to use your arm. So you reduce the pain and do a close reduction. With respect to a reference shoulder instability, the patient is more comfortable. He comes with a history of recurrent subluxation or dislocation. That means he says, uh, whenever I abduct and external rotate my arm, as in holding something or hitting something, I feel fear in my shoulder or I feel some sound. There is uh, some sort of a catch in my shoulder. After that, I have to rest my shoulder, then the pain comes down and I feel more comfortable. This is how the patient presents to you. So you have to do your clinical examination. <coughs> clinical examination will uh, involve uh, assessment of the dynamic structures and the static structure and also the neurological structures. You have to make sure the patient doesn't have generalized ligament laxity. Make sure you don't miss the ambry type. Otherwise, land surgery and the pain may come back to you with a dislocation again. If you have a um, um, too much stretchable ligament, the surgery is not going to, the regular surgeries are not going to help. Okay, so with respect to um, with respect to clinical assessment of recurrent instability, the most commonly used test, uh, the apprehension and relocation test. In apprehension test, either you have the patient sitting, sitting or uh, make the patient lie down, go to the back of the patient and do an abduction and external rotation. When you do this alone, it's an abduction, external rotation or apprehension test. But when you put your uh, hand on the front of the shoulder and try to push the head back into the glenoid, it's called relocation. So that is the completion of the test. You don't, you never do an apprehension test alone. You do an apprehension and relocation test. First, try to uh, check for the apprehension by abduction and external rotation. Look at the face of the patient. If he has apprehension, then you push the head back inside with your palm and the patient feels more comfortable in the same position of abduction and external rotation, then the abduction. Uh, uh, apprehension relocation test is positive. That means it is suggestive of an anterior instability. Similarly, for a posterior instability, you can do an apprehension test with an adduction and internal rotation. Okay. How do you manage? Initially, you manage with conservative treatment, especially an older patient who is less likely to dislocate. The dislocation risk is lower in an older patient because of uh, lower functional demands and uh, higher in, an, in a young patient. Also because in a young patient, the ligaments are supposed to be stronger. And if the first episode of dislocation has happened, it obviously has torn the ligaments more severely than in an older patient. So the ligaments are likely to need a repair. The, the re-dislocation rates in young adults is almost around 85%. So especially after the second episode, it's going to be as close to 100%. So you will need some sort of a surgical procedure. 
the further older patient you can do rehabilitation you can put him on a, on an arm sling for around uh, two weeks to three weeks to allow the capsule and the ligaments to heal or sort of fibros then you put the patient on rehabilitation muscle strengthening to strengthen the rotator cuff in order to increase the compressive forces on the humeral head okay with respect to operative treatment for the young or the repeatedly dislocating older patient you have soft tissue surgeries and bony surgeries in soft tissue surgeries you target the what are the soft tissue that are getting torn you have the anterior glenoid labrum that gets torn in addition to the antero inferior capsule so you can proceed on with an arthroscopic procedure to repair the antero inferior glenoid labrum with respect to bony structures you can either have an antero inferior glenoid fracture in addition or separately you may be having a hill sack lesion that is the impression fracture on the posterior lateral aspect of the humeral head okay. okay so if you have a large antero inferior glenoid fragment you go in in an open technique put a screw over the fix the large fragment if it's a small fragment with more of a glenoid laboratory is preferable to do an arthroscopic procedure in order to repair the glenoid labrum and along with the glenoid labrum you can also fix the small bony piece over there and there is something called remplissage for the hill sack lesion remplissage is a technique whereby the infraspinatus infraspinatus is attaching into the greater tuberosity on the back okay the infraspinatus is stuck into the impression fracture that is the hill sack lesion okay what it does it it sort of fills the hill sack lesion and it also weakens the external rotation because the length of the infraspinatus is reduced as abduction external rotation that causes anterior dislocation so when the external rotation is weakened and also the defect is filled the risk of dislocation is lower so it's successful okay so this is the basics in study of the shoulder joint both traumatic and atraumatic that is tubs and ambry in traumatic you have anterior posterior inferior and in recurrent instability recurrent is almost always anterior very rarely is posterior but it's not specifically needed for post graduate for your exams or uh, uh for now so for anterior dislocation recurrent anterior dislocation you have uh, conservative treatment and surgical treatment in surgical treatment you have an, uh, soft tissue procedures and bony procedures it can either be arthroscopic or open large bony procedures are better than open arthroscopic procedures to address the capsule or glenoid labrum or the hill sack lesion so that's all for today thank you thank you thank you shashi for that uh, brilliant presentation and you have covered almost everything about shoulder instability thank you once again and uh, i have a couple of questions actually yeah yeah so see uh, shashi the biggest problem with the shoulder instability uh, surgery with arthroscopy is yeah. the recurrence rate right yeah do you think an open surgery open bunkard repair is as yeah. good as an arthroscopic bunkard because there's a high level level one study in the jbjs american from canada which yeah. looked at uh, comparable rates of recurrence with uh, open versus arthroscopy so what is your okay. opinion what is your take on that okay 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 fine uh, coming to evidence on uh, what is better evidence keeps changing so there was a time when um, clavicular fracture was a fracture that should not be operated at all. but now the evidence is changing uh, there are comminuted fractures with uh, more than 2 cm of uh, uh, displacement the outcomes are better with respect to maintaining the length of the clavicle that means maintaining the lever arm of the uh, of the shoulder with respect to the center of the body so same way there are a lot of uh, research that is going on and uh, the evidence keeps changing and with respect to outcome we need to think about the short term outcome the mid term outcome and the long term outcome okay 
we i mean uh, we have to be more and more uh, we have to scrutinize the research or the evidence that is available what they are specifically talking about if it is the long term outcome that, is, that they are talking about yes i will agree to it but uh, we cannot ignore the short term and mid term outcomes also if a patient is losing his uh, a working capacity even for a couple of months because he is not able to get back to work earlier than uh, i mean than taking a longer time we should definitely think about it uh, because it can change his life okay and with respect to the pain factors also the pain is definitely lower for example there was a situation just uh, maybe like uh, six years to 10 years back when mini open arthroscopy mini open rotator cuff repair was still the uh, better option than arthroscopic rotator cuff repair but now more and more evidence is available that arthroscopic rotator cuff repair is better than mini open rotator cuff repair it also depends on the expertise of the surgeon when the surgeons get more and more experience the implants become more and more uh, sophisticated and the duration of surgery comes down well evidence keeps changing uh, that's good information sashi let me really say arthroscopic bank cut repair is definitely the best option in comparison to uh, open repair okay and uh, yet another question would be uh, what is your indication for doing a lethargy how often do you do a lethargy for your shoulders okay i have specific indications for my lethargy procedure now again uh, with respect to uh, i do not talk about a lot of things in shoulder instability because it's a very vast uh, topic uh, again now i was talking about uh, loss of glenoid bone okay you can have traumatic loss or erosive loss again in the erosive loss it uh, you categorize based on uh, percentage of the glenoid that is lost like 10% 15% 25% and you have the concept of engaging lesions non engaging lesion that means the when you arthroscopically when you see the humeral head uh, after you have repaired the labrum whether the head is uh, engaging or before the labral repair but uh, but the concept of engaging non engaging appears to be the concept itself appears to be a flaw because there cannot be a dislocation without an engagement now that you have done a repair it appears to be non engaging but there is also another concept of on track and off track lesions this the concepts keep on changing but i think this is not for this audience okay fine with coming to the latter j when you have a large bony loss or in other words you have an uh, inverted pure shaped glenoid uh, that means antero inferior glenoid is lost a lot okay now there are some people say it's more than 20% some people say more than 25% some people say for bipolar lesion you can't just classify based on uh, 20% or 25% you have to look at the on track off track concept of shoulder instability and all that let's not get into the into that concept wise when you have a large antero inferior bony loss you will do better with the lethargy procedure and again arthroscopic you have arthroscopic lethargy and open lethargy again as the previous evidence uh, just like a bank cut repair or a rotator cuff repair at present open lethargy appears to do as good as an arthroscopic lethargy procedure but evidence can change but with respect to lethargy it can take a lot of time because it is a complex procedure when it is done arthroscopically but what do you do in lethargy you just uh, osteotomize the coracoid from the base make sure you don't injure any structures on the medial aspect of the coracoid including the vessels and nerves and then transfer the coracoid through the subscapularis into the antero inferior glenoid and fix it over there so it sort of creates an extra support bony support for the glenoid yeah. okay shashi thank you very much for that information let me check if there are any comments from our yeah. audience uh, uh, there's a we have an option called as uh, live chat and very often we see uh, surgeons writing their comments about the lecture right yeah. now i think there's no one online so they've all 
listen to your lecture and they're very happy and they maybe they've gone to drink some tea or something yeah either they are too happy or uh, they don't understand anything okay anyways uh, thank you shashi for that brilliant lecture i think we we'll look forward for more uh, in your future yeah thank you very much thank you for the opportunity nice meeting you all of you yeah stay safe